Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Nutchen forecasts strong economic growth. Treasury Secretary Stephen Nutchen on Sunday touted the Trump administration's economic achievements, forecasting that the nation is well on its way to sustain economic growth. This was a big week for our trade and economic policies, Nutchen said on NBC's Meet the Press. We have been focused on, for the last year, creating solid economic growth. That's been a combination of tax reform, which I think you know a lot of people said would never get done, 30 years in the making, and, regulatory relief in trade. The president is focused on economic growth, Munchen added. We're well aware and on our way to our target of 3% sustained GDP. And on North Korea, the Treasury Secretary said he believed the tough economic sanctions imposed on the regime by the U.S. and others was a critical factor in the proposal now on the table for face-to-face -face talks between President Donald Trump and North Korea's leader, Kim Yun-un. I do believe that the reason, a major reason of why they're having this meeting is because the economic sanctions have had, have a very big impact on both their economy and their ability to get pieces of material and other things they need for their weapons programs, Nutchen said. Trump on North Korea I may sit down and make the greatest deal for the world. President Donald Trump on Saturday said he was the only president who could broker a deal with North Korea, talking up his newly unveiled plan to meet with Kim Jong-un while slamming his predecessor's foreign policies. Who else could do it, I mean, honestly, when you think, Trump said at a rally in Pennsylvania, where he endorsed Republican Rick Saccone ahead of Tuesday's congressional special election. They're not going to send missiles up, and I believe that, I really do. I think they want to do something. I think they want to make peace." Trump credited his own tough rhetoric, including labeling Kim as little rocket man and threatening to rain fire and fury upon the repressive, nuclear-capable regime, alongside his administration's efforts to further isolate the country and the international community for opening the door to the potentially historic talks. South Korean officials announced Thursday that Kim had extended and Trump had accepted an invitation to talks between the two countries. If it were to occur, Trump would be the first sitting U.S. president to meet with his North Korean counterpart. The White House has since suggested preconditions would need to be met before any meeting. The president said North Korea has promised to halt missile testing ahead of any discussions, a pledge he said he expects Kim to keep and that the greatest deal for the world could be reached. A lot of people thought we were going to go to war, and then all of a sudden they come and say, we are going to have a meeting, and there's no more missiles going off, and they want to denuclearize, Trump said. Nobody had heard that. But they said they are thinking about that. Trump then slammed mainstream media reporters for hailing the historic nature of the agreement immediately after its announcement and then, in his eyes, saying the next morning that anyone could make such a deal. Then, I get up in the morning, same people, they're saying not that big of a deal, anybody could have done it, Trump said of the coverage. Obama could have done it, Obama couldn't have done it. Earlier Saturday, Trump tweeted his optimism about the new policy, highlighting his recent conversations with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Chinese President Xi Jinping both of whom he said have been supportive of the efforts. Chinese President Eleven Jinping and I spoke at length about the meeting with Kim Jong-un of North Korea. President Eleven told me he appreciates that the U.S. is working to solve the problem diplomatically rather than going with the ominous alternative, Trump wrote on Twitter. China continues to be helpful. China and Russia have welcomed the possibility of a U.S.-North Korean summit, with Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov saying a summit would be a move in the right direction. At Pennsylvania rally, Trump endorses himself. Moon Township, Pennsylvania 
President Donald Trump got business out of the way quickly Saturday night, urging voters to elect Republican congressional candidate Rick Saccone, who's locked in an unexpectedly tough special election battle in Pennsylvania, before turning to the main subject of the night, himself. Returning to top campaign form, Trump made fun of Washington and congratulated himself for maintaining his iconoclastic style in office, despite critics who have called for him to take his job more seriously, including in a recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal called out by Trump. I'm very presidential, he said at one point, lowering his voice and standing artificially straight as he mocked usual political addresses. Don't forget, this got us elected, he went on, relaxing into his conversational riffy style. If I came like a stiff, you guys wouldn't come here tonight. The crowd, in an airplane hangar, cheered. One person shouted, you are one of us. Trump touted his tax reform plan, his new tariffs on steel and aluminum imports and his newly announced plan to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, while slamming the news media, including calling NBC host Chuck Todd a son of a bitch. The president also talked about his desire to impose capital punishment on drug dealers, describing a discussion with Singapore's president about that country's hardline approach. He also talked about the size of the crowd, thanking the fire marshal, a vintage campaign line, and recounted how Pennsylvania sealed his 2016 victory. He also unveiled his own new slogan for the 2020 campaign, Keep America Great. Is there anything more fun than a Trump rally? He asked at one point. Trump wrapped up by delivering an appeal to vote for Saucony on behalf of the Trump agenda, saying, We need Republicans in office. Go out on Tuesday and vote like crazy, he added. He claimed he'd won the district by, like, 22 points, though in reality it was only 20. The whole world, remember that, they're all watching, Trump concluded. This is a very important race. National and local Republicans hope Trump's visit will help stoke enthusiasm here in the final days ahead of Tuesday's special election. The race has drawn millions in outside spending as the GOP tries to avoid a disaster in a race that should have been an easy win, and in which a loss would be widely read as a referendum on the president. The visit was Trump's second, after a January appearance with Saucony by his side. Vice President Mike Pence Kellyanne Conway and Ivanka Trump have all made stops in southwestern Pennsylvania in the past month. Donald Trump Jr. is expected to headline a rally on Monday. On Saturday, the president openly acknowledged that Saucony has had a tough race, adding, Look, it's a crazy time out there. Trump attacked Saucony's opponent, Democrat Connor Lamb, who he called Lamb the Sham, for trying to act like a Republican, but as soon as he gets in, he's not going to vote for us. The president's support is key to a chaining victory on March 13, Saucony said in a speech before the president's arrival. There's no one I'd rather have in my corner than President Trump. Democrats in the district said they see Trump's visit as proof that this race is a referendum on him, because Trump is well aware with how well he did in this district, said Richard Grubb, a 75-year-old Lamb volunteer. Lamb, campaigning Saturday, said he doesn't take anything from Trump's visit. They can't get between me and the voters, Lamb said on Saturday afternoon at a canvas launch in Carnegie, Pennsylvania. Saucony, who's called himself Trump before Trump is Trump, has lagged in fundraising behind Lamb, a former federal prosecutor and Marine veteran. The pair are running to replace Rep. Tim Murphy, a Republican and the abortion rights congressman who resigned amid allegations that he urged his lover to have an abortion. National Republicans have complained that Saucony's lackluster fundraising has put the blue-collar district at risk. Candidates and campaigns matter, and when one campaign outraises the other by 6 to 1, that creates a number of challenges for outside groups trying to win a race, said Corey Bliss, executive director of the Congressional Leadership Fund the flagship super PAC. Republican outside groups have poured more than $10 million into the district, all in an effort to damage Lamb by tagging him as part of Pelosi's liberal flock, one TV ad says. The Congressional Leadership Fund spent $2.4 million on TV ads, while the National Republican Campaign Committee dropped another $3.1 million. Trump's super PAC, 
America First Action, has spent nearly $1 million. But the onslaught of negative ads hasn't kept Lamb from narrowing the race. Public polling has put Lamb and Saucony within a few points of each other. National Democrats, in contrast, have kept their distance. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee aired TV ads in early February, before going dark. And DCCC Chairman Ben Ray Lujan insisted that Lamb is the strongest voice for his own candidacy. Lamb, who's raised just under $4 million, is largely fueled by small dollar donors, who have driven fundraising for House candidates across the country. He's used the cash to air TV ads to remind voters that he won't support House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi if he's elected. My opponent wants you to believe that the biggest issue in this campaign is Nancy Pelosi. It's all a big lie, Lamb says in one ad. I've already said on the front page of the newspaper that I don't support Nancy Pelosi. At the Trump rally, Republican voters said they hope the president's visit will boost turnout. If he can come back in and stir up the same people, I don't see why he wouldn't be able to do it again, said Joan Ogle a 21-year-old Duquesne University student, wearing a Rick Saucony for Congress sticker. But, it feels close, because Connor Lamb's running a really grassroots campaign that appeals to a lot of people. Trump attacks Democrats for obstruction on appointees. President Donald Trump on Sunday blamed Senate Democrats for the dearth of experts at the State Department, ignoring the department's high turnover and the number of positions for which there is no nominee. The Democrats continue to obstruct the confirmation of hundreds of good and talented people who are needed to run our government, a record in U.S. history. State Department, ambassadors and many others are being slow-walked. Senate must approve now, Trump wrote on Twitter. The lack of experts at the State Department is receiving renewed attention after the announcement that Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un may meet for a possible historic summit. Their talks, which would be the first time in history a sitting U.S. president met with the country's leader, could include discussion of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, potentially accomplishing a long-held goal of getting North Korea to give up its nation's prized weapons program. Despite the March 8 announcement of the possible talks, the U.S. currently does not have people in a number of key roles. Trump has not named an ambassador to South Korea, and the U.S. special envoy to North Korea resigned late last month. Along with the South Korea opening, Trump has yet to name an ambassador to the European Union. The president is correct in claiming that some of his ambassador picks have been held up, including Richard Grinnell, a former spokesman for the U.S. mission to the United Nations under President George W. Bush who he tapped to be U.S. Ambassador to Germany. Politico has previously reported that Secretary of State Rex Tirson is hollowing out the State Department by leaving other top positions unfilled amid a wave of retirements, although the Secretary has scaled back those efforts. Later on Sunday, Trump blamed the media for downplaying his approval ratings. Rasmussen and others have my approval ratings at around 50 percent, which is higher than Obama. And yet the political pundits love saying my approval ratings are somewhat low. They know they are lying when they say it. Turn off the show, fake news, he wrote on Twitter, although the most recent edition of Rasmussen's daily tracking poll pegged Trump's approval rating at 44% of likely voters. The real clear politics polling average has the president's approval rating at just shy of 41%. Some polling experts have claimed that the method of the poll has an effect on the outcome, but that opinion is not universal.